Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue talking about volcanoes and volcanic hazards. So the next topic we're going to look at is flood basalts and this is going to correspond to section 6.5 of your textbook. So flood basalt eruptions are the third style of eruption associated with mafic lavas. So we've looked at scoria cone volcanoes, which are also called cinder cone volcanoes. We've looked at shield volcanoes and now we're moving on to flood basalt eruptions. So flood basalt eruptions take place where we have a fissure eruption, which is allowing lava to extrude onto the surface of the earth. So you're probably thinking to yourself straight away, well, how is this different to a shield volcano? The answer is it's all about scale, and that's going to become clear in a couple of diagrams time. So in terms of the eruption itself, flood basalts are associated with fissures. And you can see in this diagram here, fissures typically come in a couple of different varieties. We have thin ones and thick ones. Obviously, the thicker the fissure, the larger the volume of lava you can pass through it and therefore extrude onto the surface of the earth. So you can get more lava out of this larger fissure than you can the smaller fissure. And that's not a huge surprise. So flood basalts are often associated with quite thick fissures and that allows large volumes of lava to make it to the surface very, very rapidly. So when we're talking about uh, flood basalts, we are talking about absolutely huge eruptions that take place over long periods of time. We're talking millions of years, in some cases, tens of millions of years. So the good, best example of a North American flood basalt is the Columbia Plateau. And you can see this entire sequence here consists of nothing but basalts. And just to give you some idea, this sequence consists of approximately 300 basaltic lava flows. Now, you're still probably thinking to yourself, well, I'm sure there are some shield volcanoes that have, you know, 300 or so lava flows that, that you know, make that volcano up. And you would, also, you would be correct if you thought that. But when it comes to flood basalts, it's all about scale. So this is the area which is covered by the Columbia Plateau. And as you can quite clearly see, it is an absolutely huge area. So the next question is, is, well, how did you manage to get so much lava onto the surface of the Earth to actually cover this area in 300 or so lava flows? Well, each of these red lines represents dikes. And these dikes are going to represent the position of fissures through which lava was being erupted onto the surface of the earth. And so what you can see is you can see you have numerous fissures through which lava would be being erupted. Now, not all of these fissures would have been active simultaneously, but a large proportion of them would have been operating at the same time. And so because of this, it would allow you to get very, very large amounts of lava onto the surface of the earth very, very quickly. Now, the next thing you need to remember is, is that the thicker the lava flow, the longer it takes to cool. And because we are dealing with a mafic lava, which has quite a low viscosity, it is able to flow quite quickly. And so this means if you can get thick enough lava flows forming, these lava flows can cover absolutely huge distances. So, for instance, there's one lava flow that managed to make it all the way from Spokane here all the way to the Pacific coast in the space of about one month. So that's an average speed of about half a mile an hour, which is pretty fast for a lava flow. And so this gives you some idea about the size of these flows. They will have been very, very thick, and that will have allowed them to retain enough heat to you know, travel these huge distances. And so this is the main difference between flood basalt eruptions and shield volcanoes. It's all about the size. So the next thing we need to think about is how do flood basalts actually form? Well, flood basalts are associated with hotspots, and of course we know hotspots are the result of mantle plume activity. So let's go through the model once again. So a mantle plume is a ball of very, very hot mantle rocks. Now, because they're so hot, they have a lower density than the surrounding mantle, and so this block of very hot mantle rock naturally wants to rise, and that's exactly what it does. It starts off down at the base of the mantle towards the core mantle boundary, and it comes shooting up through the mantle, heading towards the base of the lithosphere. Now, as it's rising through the mantle, obviously the pressure is dropping. And of course, this is going to eventually lead to decompression melting. 
So in our model here, you can see we have a piece of continental lithosphere. There's the continental crust. Here is the lithospheric mantle attached to the bottom of it. So we know this is solid. So this layer down here is going to be the asphenosphere. And here is our mantle plume, which has come hurtling up all the way from the core mantle boundary. And of course, we know that as it's entering this region, the pressure is going to be getting low enough for it to begin to partially melt. So when the plume hits the base of the lithosphere, it will spread out laterally and it will produce this rather distinctive mushroom like shape. So the plume is going to flatten out along the base of the lithospheric mantle and we know that the plume itself is going to be partially melting. So we're going to start forming mafic magmas right here. Now, the other thing that's going to be happening, though, is we are going to have uh, mafic, sorry, ultramafic uh, mantle rocks here as well as part of the lithospheric mantle. And the heat from this plume is also going to start to melt some of the lower temperature minerals, which are part of the lithospheric mantle as well. And so we end up with this situation where we have uh, mafic magma being generated from the melting of the mantle plume, and we have mafic magma being generated due to the melting, or should I say the partial melting, of the lithospheric mantles. This produces a huge quantity of basaltic magma, so mafic magma, that rises towards the surface and pours out via the fissures in the form of flood basalts. Now, the most important thing to remember is that in order to form a flood basalt, you obviously require huge volumes of mafic lava. And the only mechanism that really allows you to produce these large volumes is a mantle plume. And so we know, therefore, that flood basalts and mantle plumes must be intimately related to each other. So if we look at the map, we can see some of the major flood basalt terrains on the surface of the Earth. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that these terrains occur both on the continents and in ocean basins. So it doesn't matter what kind of crust your mantle plume gets stuck under, it still has the capacity to produce flood basalt eruptions. So you'll notice that some of the major terrains are marked out for us. So obviously there's the Columbia Plateau, which we discussed earlier, but there are also some other terrains such as the North Atlantic terrain. So this is related to a mantle plume which is currently stuck under the spreading ridge, which goes down the middle of the North Atlantic. So obviously uh, we can see this mantle plume, or more accurately the flood basalts resulting from this mantle plume, expressed in the form of the island of Iceland. So Iceland has been produced by these flood basalt eruptions. Now we can see that what's happened over time is we've had the flood basalt eruptions taking place here uh, where the divergent plate boundary is located and of course over time due to the uh, creation of new crust at the divergent boundary the flood basalt terrain has actually been extended towards Europe and towards North America. So other important flood basalt terrains are the Athar region of Africa. So this is related to the uh, East African Rift Valley. So of course, this is related to mantle plume activity situated underneath continental crust. So there's also a couple of very famous flood basalt terrains here. We have the Deccan Traps of India picked out right here. So this is very important because this is a flood basalt terrain that was active during the Cretaceous and it was considered to be one of the possible causes for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Now arguably the largest of the flood basalt terrain terrains which are currently known about is the Siberian Traps of Russia. And as you can quite clearly see, this is a flood basalt um, eruption that has covered an absolutely gargantuan area. So if you remember that image of the Columbia Plateau that we saw earlier, well, that covered quite a substantial portion of the northeastern, no, sorry, northwestern states of the US. But look at the size of it here compared to the Siberian Traps. So the Siberian Traps was clearly an absolutely massive flood basalt eruption, arguably the largest one that's ever happened in Earth history. And then we have a couple of examples of flood basalt terrains which are forming uh, on the seafloor. So we have the Ong Tong Java over here, and we have Kyrgyzlan, which is located down here in the southern Indian Ocean. These are examples where we have a mantle plume trapped under oceanic crust. So I hope this managed to cover most of the basic features of flood basalts. Thank you for watching and have a good day.